Okay, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, is this sounding okay? All right. So welcome to the 2019 Counterforce Lab Lecture Series. Um, I am Professor Rebecca Mendez, uh, Design Media Arts, and I am the founder and director of the Counterforce Lab. The lab is a research and field work studio based in Design Media Arts Department at UCLA, dedicated of using art and design to develop creative collaborations, new fields of study, methods to research, create, and execute projects around the social and ecological impacts of the Anthropocene era, a time in the geological record when human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. An era where humans have moved the planet outside of its natural limits. And I'd like to just take a little bit of a break to introduce the team of Counterforce Lab. Maru Garcia Fierro, who's back there, who has been graduate student research and uh, for a year and now is going to um, graduate fellow of the center. Um, Jason Lee, who is here and who was, uh, he, who is a designer and he was involved in winter of 2016 in designing the brand, the logo type that you see with the dots everywhere. And it's based on the Newton's cradle. We have Kobe Otsuka, who is here in the audience, who has been an intern for a quarter. And then now we have Erin Cooney, who is fellow, going to be fellow for 2019 and 2020. Welcome, welcome, Erin. And we have Dr. Jogan Mueller, who is becoming from Belgium, uh, from Brussels, as a visiting scholar for 2019 and 20. And I'd also want to announce that um, I just got nominated for the UCLA Sustainability Research and Engagement Award by UCLA of Sustainability. It honors UCLA's faculty, staff, and students who have made significant contributions to sustainability through their work at UCLA. As you know, so many of my students are here that it is their work. It is what we have been doing in the classes that has really landed us with this recognition. Um, some of the students have been working and researching around projects of waste awareness, migration caused by climate crisis in the U.S. and Mexico border, and on remediation, and that's just to name a few. And of course, you can see a lot of the works at counterforcelab.org. And we definitely are a counterforce, and anyone that wants to join, please definitely um, talk to us. But back to Anthropocene. We are at this moment in a time where the environment is surfacing as an existential crisis for all of us. The history of the Earth is 4.5 billion years, and in the 10,000 years of modern civilization, we have had a huge effect on the Earth. How small we are in relative to this history of the Earth, and how much effect and impact we have had. How much we have dominated. In the last 70 years, our fleeting species has had more effect than all natural processes combined. When we consider the ethics and politics surrounding the Anthropocene, there is criticism where people argue that the Anthropocene should be called Capitalocene. Because actually, there is really only a small fraction of people who are responsible for a lot of the dynamics on the Earth systems. We all partake of the Earth but there are some that partake just a lot more than others. There is a radical imbalance, and Anthropocene perhaps does not address that. The colonial mindset, which is still very much and alive, very much alive, <laughs> that was a funny pause there, in a capitalist way, continues to conquer and expand at the expense of everyone that might get in the way or it exploits or, or, or it's exploitable or expandable. So what can art and design do to help us leap into envisioning how to live with each other in a more equitable way and how to live with this planet in a more sustainable way? And I really mean a leap because I think that in this instance, the, there's some processes in which we can allow the time for the process to take all its stages. Right now we really need a leap so that we can um, uh, enter and we can rescue our planet. So questions that we have is, can we envision, can we consider 
what does the earth want? And here I look into the Harrisons, um, Helen and Newton Harrison, who said that uh, these eco-artists, the, the, the first eco-artists that they claimed themselves as such, that they said that their only client that they had was the earth, the planet. What does life on earth want? What does a bald eagle want? Can we actually enter into interspecies friendships that are with wild animals and not just our cats? What did Sudan, the last of the white rhino species, wanted? Can we envision a shift in our value system that is in harmony with life on Earth? Can we make this concept of the Anthropocene something that everybody understands is real <clears throat> and reflects on their own participation? Can we radically unlearn our overconsuming habits and radically commit to a sustainable life on Earth? If we, if we look at the word radical, it comes from, it, it means roots. It comes from the Latin word that I don't remember it right now, but it means roots. And it's something that it is at the basic and it is the most essential of things. So the word radical has been completely misunderstood, but we do need to become radical. We need to go back to our roots. These are some of the questions of th that, that we ponder in the, uh, and, and we are preoccupied with at the Counterforce Lab. So then who better to bring here today than Pinar Yoldash? Right, Yoldash? Nice, I wanted to pronounce it as you would pronounce it, Yoldash. Uh, because with her otherworldly imagination, she is someone who radically expands this inquiry. Pinar Yoldash is an in infradisciplinary designer, artist, and researcher. Her work develops within biological sciences and digital technologies through ar architectural installations, kinetic sculptures, sound, video, and drawing with a focus on post-humanism, econihilism, Anthropocene, and feminist technoscience. Her solo shows include the warm, the Cool and the Cat at Roda Sten Konstal in Sweden, at the Polytechnicum Museum in Moscow, in Moscow, <laughs> I guess in Moscow, an ecosystem of excess at Ernst sh uh, Sharing Project Space in Berlin. Her work has been reviewed and featured widely, including R21 blog and Vogue Turkey. And her book, An Ecosystem of Excess, was published by Argo Books in 2014. Pinar is a 2015 John Simon Guggenheim Fellow in the Fine Arts and a 2016 Future Emerging Arts and Technologies Award recipient. She holds degrees in so many things and it is wonderful because we see them all in all your work. In architecture, communication design, computer science, design and media arts, and received a PhD at Duke University where she was affiliated with Duke Institute of Brain Sciences and Media Arts and Sciences. Pinar joined the UC San Diego Visual Arts Department as assistant professor at the start of 2018. I have known Pinar since, 20, since 2006 when she joined our department as an MFA candidate. We connected in so many ways and certainly in our passion for chemistry. We have figured out today that we connected in another way that Pinar will talk about. She received the bronze medal in organic chemistry in the Turkish National Science Olympics. So we also, in a funny way, connect as Olympians, <laughs> right? Um, I was in the Olympic team of gymnastics in, uh, in Mexico, so that's a funny and interesting fact. And she had her, solo, her first solo painting when she was five. I just love that. <laughs> Pinar has never stopped excelling. Her meticulous research, ingenuity, curiosity, and enthusiasm was courageous when she was a student and continues to be contagious. She is a beautiful force of life to reckon with. It is my honor to present Pinar Yoldash for you. Hello everyone. Is the microphone actually working? Yeah, okay. Rebecca, that was such a beautiful introduction. I got so emotional. <laughs> Soon I have to gather myself uh, to continue. So I'll take a moment to start the meeting.
today um, I will follow a slightly different approach uh, than my other artist talks where I will focus more on uh, the theory behind my work. Uh, it's not very complicated actually. I will try to talk about um, maybe a methodology that can help most of uh, us artists and designers to think about uh, climate crisis, environmental degradation, and all of the things uh, Anthropocene related that uh, Rebecca just mentioned. Um, so the key concepts of the day are Anthropocene, umwelt, imperceptibility, causality, and malleable culture, or the fact that culture is malleable. Um, Rebecca already defined it, but uh, I believe all of us in this room uh, have heard of the term Anthropocene. Is there anyone who is hearing it for the first time? Nope? Okay. Well, then I won't have the pleasure to define it. I actually really like defining this because uh, the person who coined the term is uh, Paul J. Crutzen. There is, you know, um, rumors or debates that uh, other people coined the term before, but um, it appeared, I think, uh, for the first time around 2001 in um, a, geologi a summit for uh, geologists where they were trying to decide what to name the current epoch. And because they have a tradition of uh, choosing the most impactful force on the face of the earth to name that era, they picked Anthropos, uh, which means uh, human, uh, as the human beings have become the most impactful force on the face of the earth, such as volcanoes and uh, earthquakes, actually even more impactful than that. And that's uh, the origin of the term. Um, my second uh, concept comes from uh, Jacob von Uxkill. Uh, he's dead. He's a, a Baltic semiotician, a biosemiotician. He studies uh, the science of meaning making in the natural world. And in his uh, beautiful book uh, called A Foray into the World of Animals and Plants, I believe, he talks about this notion of Umwelt. Are, do we have any German speakers among us? Keine? No one? Umwelt, what does Umwelt mean auf Deutsch? No? Okay, well, it means environment. So if you ever go to Berlin or Frankfurt, uh, you'll see this everywhere because, you know, protect the environment is everywhere. But um, the way Jacob von Uxkill uses the term is different. He uses it uh, to define the perception and action world of an organism. Here's a gr really great diagram, actually from his book. And um, as you can see, there is a mark organ, and that means a receptor, and an action organ, and that means an actuator, or like a muscle or hand. And um, he talks about how uh, an organism's uh, sense organs uh, in the way, the, in the capacities they have to sense the world around them or inside them, and their action organs in their ca capacities to affect the world again around them and inside them makes up this uh, notion of their umwelt. I like to call this his theory the theory of bubbles. Uh, basically, we live in, we all live in our own bubble, and okay, I know that sounds cheesy when I say it like that, but um, sense, our senses and perce perceptions combined with our actions make up our bubbles. So um, if we think about how many people are in there in this room right now, together with uh, potential insects and other microorganisms, there are as many um, r uh, bubbles in this room as the number of living things. And um, to give an example, Uxkul talks about this, uh, the tick, the story of the tick. Uh, how many um, sense organs do you think a tick needs to, uh, be, to operate in the world and to succeed? This is a question. How many, how many sense organs does the tick? Do we all know what the tick is? It's a, it, it sucks your blood, it gives you Lyme disease. How many organs, how many senses Senses or modalities could the thick uh, would the thick need? It's just brainstorm. Yes. Detect what? 
heat. It's a good start. Let's keep it in our pockets. So we have temperature. What else? Yes. Uh, I saw a hand, but you were just scratching your head. Sound? Okay, let's keep it in our pocket too, unless we find something better than that. Smell, yes. So we have smell, temperature, sound. What else might we need? If you were to think of, get yourself into the bubble of fatigue, what would you need? Moisture. Why would we, why would it need moisture? That could be a good guess, because blood is wet, it's true. Uh, yes? Pardon me? Yes. Yes, it needs to land on something, because uh, the thing that carries blood is potentially moving, unless it's sleeping, could still be moving. So um, honestly, um, the closer answer is the temperature, smell, and touch. But uh, the tick isn't like us. It's very specific. It needs to be very specific. It lives in a perfectly precise world. What does that mean? It's only responsive to 36.5 degrees Celsius, which happens to be the body temperature of mammals, yes. Butyric acid, which again happens to be the smell that all mammals secrete, and touch, which will say, hey, you landed on this thing, right? So these are the correct answers. And when it lands, what does it do? What's its action? Biting, right? And uh, this really blew my mind when I found out about this. If none of these markers are in its environment, a tick can stay dormant for up to 18 years. How patient a tick could be. Speaking of patience, it's a great, it's a actually a great, um, you know, example of uh, being really uh, persistent on your goal. And um, Uxkill says the very poverty of this world, poverty meaning it only has three senses, and those are super specific, right? Uh, this world guarantees the unfailing certainty of her actions, and security is more important than wealth. I love that. Now, what about us humans? How many senses do we have? Let's start with the simple ones. Of course, we have temperature. We sense pressure as well, right? Uh, we can see. What else do we have? Pardon me? Yeah. Yes, audition, we hear. Well, taste was first, but audition, yes. Nociception is what? Pain reception, right? We smell. And proprioception is... Uh, uh, balance. We can uh, tell whether we're falling or not. But actually, uh, there's a theory of five senses, um, but we have as many senses as the type of receptors we have. So these are kind of broad categories. And um, the thing that separates us from the tick is that our world is much richer. Uh, we're not only sensitive to 36.5 degrees Celsius, right? We can. Um, Perceive up to 60 degrees Celsius, then we'll be burned. We can go down. We can see between 380 to uh, 760 nanometers. We can hear a uh, very wide range of, you know, sound, etc. So our world, compared to the tick's world, is very rich. Uh, so, is this helping you conceive of what a bubble is? Like the bubble, think of it as you know, multiple dimensions, each of which are defined by your senses. And depending on how many senses uh, you have and its spectrum, you have a bigger or a smaller bubble. So uh, to make this easier for all of us, I focused on hearing here. Um, so that's us humans. Um, I couldn't find super specific papers on this, but apparently we can hear up to 300 meters, whereas an elephant can hear up to 150 miles. So I came from San Diego. I believe it's 150 miles away. So if I were an elephant, I would be able to hear what's going on in San Diego just standing here. As a human, I need a cell phone, right? Uh, same for whales. Um, their hearing is uh, much more precise and can span really wide ranges. So uh, think of a whale who is in the ocean hearing all the noise pollution that's happening uh, in the ocean. Uh, they can't really wear uh, ear 
muffs, right? So the bubbles um, both define the richness and the breadth of the world, but they can also um, define um, how much, how, uh, how much the uh, creature will be affected, right? I just left the tick as a dot there because it's pretty negligible compared to all these other creatures. So um, there are things that fall beyond our umwelt, such as these, right? Um, most people can't detect caffeine. I don't know if there is any, some people say, oh, I can taste caffeine in this decaf. I'm not one of those, definitely. Give me anything and I'll drink it. Uh, climate change is one of them, right? We don't have a sense specifically targeted for uh, such global changes over um, long spans of time. Gravitational waves is another one. We need to build devices to measure such things. Infrared light, right, pesticides. Uh, there were strawberries for the opening. I don't know if there were pesticides in them because I can't taste it, right? Um, radio frequency exposure and volatile, volatile organic compounds, which is in the air right now, but I can't tell if they're there. So what other simile falls beyond our umwelt? This is again a question. <laughs> What other things are there that we need to use devices for, or they are there, but we won't know it because our bubbles are, yes. Radiation, yes. Uh, we would see the impact of it, but we won't immediately feel it when it's in our environment, right? So I hope all of these examples are giving you, and it's drawing a picture of what this bubble is like, right? Now, the concept that I think is important for us art artists and designers is imperceptibility. And the definition of imperceptibility is that anything that falls beyond our umwelt becomes imperceptible. And that breaks causality. So how did they make that, how did I make that jump? And I so when I saw this, uh, when it's talk was happening, I was just like, oh, I can't believe that we've been thinking about the same symbol, the same concept, the same notion, because um, this um, Aristotel Aristotelian way of cause and effect for us is broken. Imperceptibility breaks causality, here's how. So Aristotelian causality is what we are very good at, right? Um, I drop something, it breaks. I drop something, it makes a sound, there's a cause, there's an effect, it's immediate, it happens in my perceptual bubble, it happens in my umwelt, and uh, everything is fine. And it works perfectly for all of us to survive, right? So this is how it is. But uh, in the current world, there's a cause, such as this, and this is, uh, spread from uh, the Life magazine from 1955. Uh, we're looking at the very birth of disposable consumerism, disposable plastics. Um, and uh, in the article, they claim that by uh, using, they say actually, let me read it. The objects flying through the air in this picture would take 40 hours to clean, except that no housewife, housewife need bother. So by using disposable, uh, items, mostly plastics, you would cut down, uh, you know, you'd have an extra 40 hours to spend on buying more things or shopping more. So that's the beginning, right? And this is the effect. But within our own umwelt and within the senses that we're endowed with and the action organs that we're endowed with, it's impossible to feel it immediately. Uh, the, the next picture, I'm sure most of you have seen this. This is Chris Jordan documenting um, the wonderful fusion of nature and culture. Now, uh, imperceptibility breaks causality because um, just by drinking from a plastic bottle, I will not immediately make the connection to the dead albatross chick, right? There are all these steps in between, these steps, are not in my perceptual bubble, right? Out of sight, out of, out of mind. There is mass consumption of the same item, item again and again. There is waste 
an accumulation of waste over time, and then it somehow finds its way to the ocean and becomes pelagic plastics. You actually, this takes six years, I'll talk about it later. And then uh, it's fed to the Lazen albatross chick by its mother, and uh, we get the effect, right? But for me, the human being who is living in her own cute bubble, all of those intermediary steps are missing. Therefore, I will not, I will not make that connection immediately. But if every time I drank from a plastic water bottle, a lazen albatross fell on my head, right? Things would have been different, maybe. I was still a student here back then. Uh, this is a sperm, baby sperm whale washed out uh, around Spain uh, by a beach in Spain. And um, it's uh, going through a very painful lingering process of death. And when um, she finally dies, they cut her open and find, um, I think, 17 kilograms of plastic sheets. A bunch of other, you know, uh, plastic waste, but mostly sheets that clogged uh, her intestines, her digestive tract. And um, those sheets come from Almera, Spain, uh, which happens to be the capital of greenhouse uh, farming. Uh, this is one of the uh, biggest suppliers of uh, fresh produce to England, actually. And because of this, there are um, an increasing number of dead whales that wash out around the beaches of Spain. Uh, this is a huge problem. Uh, the plastic sheets that are used for growing fresh vegetables, tomatoes, cucumbers, whatnot, are finding their way to the ocean, finding their way to the digestive tract of the cetaceans, causing this uh, lingering death. Right, it's always there, those are sheets. Now, if every time I munched on a tasty, sweet piece of cherry tomatoes, a veil fell on my head, it would have been different, right? First up, it would be nasty and messy. I wouldn't want to eat uh, vegetables anymore because there would be coarse corpses everywhere. Secondly, I would probably have died with the first attack. Third, the cause and effect would be so clear to me that I would display behavioral change. Now, um, this is kind of a sidetrack, but I wanted to insert this here too. Uh, this is Jean Piaget's uh, Object Permanence, Psych 101. And um, in the first, I think up to three years of uh, neuronal development, uh, babies display this behavior where when an object isn't in their visual field anymore, they just think that it's gone, right? They're not like, let's say there's something behind this. They're not like, oh, I know that there, there's, uh, you know, the horse behind the screen. For them, it's just gone. And we find the same type of behavior with Senator Jim Inhofe when he says this. The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable of uh, national attention and in, in, in case we have forgotten because we keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record i asked the chair you know what this is it's a snowball and that's just from outside here so it's very very cold out very unseasonal so here mr president catch this mm -hmm. um, he's very pleased with himself so to help people like Janitor, uh, Senator Jim uh, Inhofe and ourselves as well, how can we bring the imperceptible back to our umwelt? That's the, that, I think that's a design question. So that's the challenge. The real challenge is design of a new culture where none of these things are ever imperceptible to us. Right, design of a new culture, those are some of the 
uh, my favorite aspects of this new culture. You're free to add more. That's why I left those dots for you. But that's the real challenge, because we need to design culture. Which brings me to my third point, that culture is malleable. And I have solid proof. Remember this article from um, the Life magazine, the Lifestyle magazine? And this, right? It took literally 60 years to come uh, to start with this point where there is no disposable plastics at all to disposable plastics everywhere, including the digestive tracts of uh, benign organisms. Only 60 years. So culture changes. It's not something static. It's not something solid. Another good example is actually smoking. There used to be a guy called Edward Bernays uh, who invented, uh, I think, who is one of the masterminds behind public propaganda. And he made sure, he uh, designed campaigns to uh, encourage young women to smoke cigarettes. This is 1930s. Smoking cigarettes wasn't a cool thing back then. And uh, the campaign was called Torches of Freedom. He invented most of the techniques of advertising and propaganda that we use uh, still today. And uh, a lot of more women started smoking. Actually, smoking turned into this public phenomenon. It was kind of, you know, um, a very cool thing to do. But fast forward 50 years, uh, it wasn't cool anymore. And there were anti-smoking campaigns everywhere. And in California, especially here, uh, smoking is not cool at all. I came here as a smoking person from Europe and then I was like, okay, it's not cool anymore. I must stop so that I don't smoke anymore. So it's a cultural thing, and we saw the effects uh, with smoking, and I think, I believe we can get the same effect with um, things like disposable plastics. Only six years. Uh, this is, I, I just put this image here because um, this is a, a toy from 1962 that was recently found in an uh, ocean beach cleanup, and it was... Um, you know, it's only 57 years old. Now, um, from this point on, I will show some case studies and I will have to be very quick with them. I have too many projects to talk about, so I'll, I just picked four, but maybe we'll stick with three, we'll see. Um, one of them is um, about uh, climate crisis. And it starts with this image, always cool, always Coca-Cola. Unfortunately, it doesn't apply to the Arctic anymore. But in uh, 1993, and I remember this uh, campaign very well as a kid, uh, Coca-Cola introduces the polar bear ad campaign. And this is 2019. The idea behind global warming, um, hot yoga studio, came to me while I was thinking about these um, conflicting images, right? Like the Coca-Cola ad versus what's been happening uh, right now. And again, there are some people out there who claim that uh, when you talk about skinny polar bears losing their habitat or dying, people really don't care about climate ch change um, or climate crisis or global warming. Uh, you need to really bring it to their everyday of lives, which is a solid proof that this whole notion of umwelt works. So I was thinking to myself, okay, how can we do this? What are some, you know, uh, interesting ways to accomplish this? And at the time, I was practicing Bikram, and um, 
I was also writing my dissertation on the subject, so I guess all of that sweating helped. And um, I was very interested in, again, since I came to California, like this yoga culture and um, anti-stress. And uh, this is, again, an example of how culture is malleable, right? There was a point in history where yoga wasn't a thing. And then there's all kinds of like cultural symbols or uh, people who make it popular and then it's everywhere. And um, I thought that, well, yoga is actually really effective. I am really focused when I'm doing yoga and it's hot. So maybe I can combine it with global warming. So I designed the yoga stage um, where it says global warming, literally. Um, I used uh, heat lamps, so when you walk to the sign, it's actually hot. And I also uh, wrote a script because, um, again, the, some the Western practices, also the Eastern practices, there is a script that uh, yogis and yoginis follow. And uh, we practiced yoga under this light, the sign that read global warming. Is there some more images? Um, so it's about 25 minutes, can go longer. So I had different asanas, and for each asana, I had a different script, such as welcome to the Global Warming Yoga Studio, uh, bring your attention to your body, to your own self, uh, to your highly individualized presence in an accelerating world, inhale the particulate matter, exhale your cognitive dissonance, you are a tree in the big forest of humanity. Sand your roots deep down to reach groundwater, polluted by biocides, heavy metals, nitrates, and lead. So I gave this to the yoga instructors, and they kind of took their own spin on it. And we'll see a very short documentation. Namaste. Welcome to the Global Warming Hot Yoga Studio. This is a collective sweating experience. Purify your skin, purge your internal organs, your thoughts, your heart, and your spirit of all the toxins that surround you. Look at your reflection in the mirror, back of the eye. So I won't play the whole thing, but um, honestly, I was. I thought this was a very literal piece, maybe the most literal piece I've ever done. But then I had my reasons because uh, we know from neuroscience that to increase heightened mem memories, to remember, uh, to enforce learning, it's always good to involve the body. So when your body is involved, when there is an aroused state of mind emotionally as well, learning happens. Therefore, a yoga environment where there is multiple people around you and where you're practicing something all together is good because uh, there are more people, more people means more, awa more uh, arousal and uh, more attention, right? And um, heat is good also because you're sweating, you're feeling the heat in your joints, in your body, so there's a lot of stimuli coming from the environment. And on top of this, there's the script, which is you know speaking to your, I guess, um, cerebral cortex or to your intellect. So I was like, all right, this is, looks like a kind formula, but from an art perspective, it's super literal. I don't know if it's gonna work. Um, and the first iteration, which was in Sweden, didn't really work because Sweden was too cold and my lamps weren't enough to heat up the space. So everyone was cold and there was the global warming and we were all stressed and it was not good. But then in Belgium, uh, this yoga teacher really liked the idea and he, you know, practiced again and again, and then uh, he sent me emails telling me how awesome it was and whether he could keep the sign. And it's been traveling, it's going to Madrid uh, in two weeks, actually. So that's an example. The next one I'm going to talk about very briefly, because uh, I want to spend more time on the ecosystem of excess is science spring dining event. This is another work that I've done uh, since my last talk here in 2016. 
And this time, I was really interested in uh, this uh, list called the Dirty Dozen. Have you heard of it? Dirty Dozen? Uh, it's basically the uh, gross, it's a list which is, it, it's updated every year, but strawberries, celery, potatoes, whatnot, the top produce uh, with the most amount of pesticides in them. Uh, you should, you know, stay away from them. So I took that list and I organized a dining event uh, around this concept. Um, but the title comes from Rachel Carson, who is um, an environmental thinker, uh, the first woman in scientist and the science writer, who talked about the negative impact of the chemical revolution on American society, on, on public health, and um, she actually suffered for it. Uh, at the, the last five years of her life, after publishing her book in 1960s, she was in trials and she died of cancer, uh, and I don't know if there's a correlation there, but um, the companies, the pesticide, the chemical companies gave her a hard time for publishing this book, yet she lit a torch, right? So I wanted to dedicate a dinner to her, and this is our uh, poster. Um, I basically made um, bowls and cups that were inspired by the flowers or the fruits of these uh, top 12, 30 dozen. And um, the event took place in the Natural History Museum and I had 12 guests. Four of them were uh, organic farmers or farmers. Four of them were victims of pesticides and lead in the water. Uh, I organized the event in Michigan and around the time uh, they had this lead scandal, there was lead in the water and a lot of children were suffering from it. So I had victims of that and I invited scholars, uh, environmentalists and um, scholars who study uh, sustainable architecture and then I invited senators and governors, none of, they didn't show up. But um, th then we had this conversation while looking at the dishes and you know, talking about the effect of this. Um, now the next project, I don't know how much time I have. Okay. I'm good, okay. It's an ecosystem of excess. And if you, I've given you a talk about this before, uh, please bear with me, I'll keep it shorter. Um, this project is um, something I started to think, think about when I was at uh, UCLA DMA, when I was here. Uh, because I had just moved from Turkey, uh, Istanbul, and my first month, um, there were a lot of life lifestyle changes. Uh, for instance, I had to drive everywhere. I was sleeping in this like totally carpeted place which smelled really different to me. And I was uh, producing a lot of trash, just eating lunch, uh, you know, every day. I was creating a lot of trash. So I started to pay attention to what was happening. And um, then I found out about uh, this um, really mind-blowing site called the Pacific Trash Vortex. It was around 2007. And uh, then I started digging deeper into it. And um, this is an image I found uh, around that time. Uh, a plastic chair at the bottom of the ocean in the Baltic area. Uh, it's about six kilometers down at the bottom of the ocean uh, in a terrifyingly beautiful uh, ocean storm of plankton with microplastics. And honestly, just last week, or maybe two weeks ago, um, on, uh, an explorer went to the deepest uh, spot in the ocean, like a, 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 a location that no man has ever been before, and there was a plastic bag. So um, the bottom of the ocean is uh, statistically where most of plastic waste sinks. It's 60% there. Uh, so I learned about this and it really blew my mind. It's, you know, you think of this, the bottom of the ocean or uh, open ocean as a very pristine place, but hey, wait, there is this like floating nexus of plastic waste in the middle of it. So um, yeah, some facts, I'm sure all of you know about this because this is a Pacific Ocean phenomenon. Uh, waste gathers in the gyre over six years, 80% of the waste that comes to the gyre is coming from the land and uh, it's an international spectacle. Um, all the countries around the Pacific contribute to this almost equally, uh, US being the top plastic uh, waste producer. 
And um, the waste that gathers in the vortex goes through a process called photodegradation, which uh, ends up, uh, which leads to the formation of microplastics. And microplastics is basically uh, tiny pieces of plastics that are between 5 to 50 nanometers in uh, diameter. So I already showed you this image, right? And this is the aftermath while well, they're kind of collecting this. And this is where we are now. We're all we're thinking about, oh, what are we going to do with, about this plastics? We need to clean it. So there are all kinds of cleanup actions. And um, this is, again, uh, from a lifestyle magazine in, uh, from 50s. You'll have a greater chance to be yourself than any people in the history of civilization as of 2019. Maybe as of this week, we have nailed the skull. Uh, and then there's this. Right, um, although plastics is everywhere and it's um, clogging, uh, you know, the digestive tracts of marine birds and marine animals and uh, marine turtles and all of this, uh, life finds a way to adopt, right? Uh, this is a war between polymers, keratin versus high density polyethylene. And um, despite the fact that this, these turtles might be suffering, um, excruciating pain through digestion, they are actually alive. So life finds a way. I, I found this image and I, I was actually hopeful. Um, then um, this is another image that triggered my thinking around that time. Captain Charles Moore, an environmental activist, he lives in San Diego, around this uh, institution called Algolita, and he discovered the Pacific trash vortex around 1997. And I found a video where he's holding a sample saying the ocean has turned into a soup, uh, into a plastic soup, this is the soup. And at that time, I immediately thought about the primordial soup theory, right? 3.8 uh, billion years ago, life starts in the salty wombs of ancient oceans. And then I asked this question, what if life started now in our plastic ocean? What kind of life forms would emerge? Um, so the exhibition was basically my attempt to design an entire ecosystem. And uh, to start the ecosystem, I needed to start with microorganisms. And uh, I had this uh, flask, which had pieces from every single object that I touched. Uh, starting from my day until the end of my day, which is plenty. Actually, um, there is a book called Plastic, a Toxic, Toxic Love Story by Suzanne Frankel, and she makes the same list, and it's, you know, alarm clock, mattress pad, uh, kettle handle, car door handle, water bottle, etc. The list keeps going. So I chipped away these parts, and then I started mixing it in a flask, and after some time, some microorganisms emerged. Um, I don't have those images now. And then I, I analyzed them. They were not anything impressive. Uh, they were just regular bacteria. But then again, around the same time, I uh, found out about, I have to go back to that, uh, the work uh, where uh, scientists discovered this whole new uh, microbiome called the plastisphere. And uh, these are bacteria that emerged in Saragossa Sea, and now they're, you know, kind of, uh, there's more and more papers about this. Uh, and they thrive uh, in plastics. Uh, we don't know if it's good or bad, uh, but they are uh, literally uh, plastic loving bacteria. So uh, my task as a designer was basically start from uh, with that and extrapolate to other life forms. And um, the, what makes this project unique for me is that uh, it also documents my own journey, getting more aware of plastics in my environment. And um, I corresponded with about five different science uh, groups and I found scientific papers where they show the impact of plastics. And this is, you know, 2010, 2013, that time. Now there is much more, um, how to say it, um, awareness and much more uh, discussion around plastics in the media, in the social media at least. And um, this young scientist, Miriam Goldstein, had shown that 
Uh, although insects, aquatic insects, don't like living in the open ocean, after the introduction of microplastics, they would uh, prefer to lay their eggs in the open ocean. So their numbers increase. And I uh, designed um, a group of uh, a taxa for uh, plastic-loving aquatic insects. Uh, then I moved to the beach. Uh, nurdles are a big problem. Let's go back here. It's the colloquial name given to uh, pre-plastic production pellets. And um, these, you know, uh, kind of translucent drops are basically the building blocks of anything that's plastics around you. But um, they're produ produced in like, I don't know, Megatons, I think the number I remember is 113 million tons uh, a year in, in the States only, and uh, they escape the, uh, the boundaries of the, corporate, uh, the, the corporations and the facilities, and they become the number one beach contaminant. And they're really hard to clean, because uh, they're very small. They're called mermaid's tears, for a reason. And um, I thought about some life forms who might enjoy living on this, uh, you know, beach. And um, this is Pacific balloon turtle. Uh, again, I was looking into science papers where another scientist showed that given the option between a clear plastic and a colored plastic, a hungry marine turtle would almost always opt for the colored plastic. Uh, plastics and colored plastics uh, the main uh, source of that in this case is balloons uh, there is a thing called balloon pollution and uh, in the ecosystem of excess after eating balloons for eons this uh, turtle develops uh, an inflatable back which should hopefully give it a survival advantage and edge in the face of rising sea levels it could also be a fitness indicator uh, then I had some enigmatic taxa, things that I didn't know what they were for, right? Like the PVC for warm in this picture. And um, I had these uh, benthic eggs. Um, they're red because uh, this reptile who lives in the benthic area uh, lays the eggs down there uh, because we talked about how rich it is uh, at the bottom of the ocean in terms of plastics, right? And uh, then I had uh, birds. And for that, I, my inspiration was flamingos who attain their beautiful colors from the krill they eat. Uh, they have this, you know, almost fluorescent orange color. And my question was, well, I just read this paper where they claim that 30% of uh, marine birds, um, you know, digestive intake is bottle caps. So after eating bottle caps for eons, maybe they'll attain corporate colors. So I call them, I call them uh, Pantone birds, and this one is uh, Coca-Cola red. So I have a Coca-Cola red bird, I have an Evian pink bird, I have a Dasani blue bird, right? Um, this is a newer display that I made because this exhibition since 2013 has been traveling a lot. I have many iterations where I kind of match the colors with, you know, different um, corporate colors, uh, the, the feathers with the different corporate colors. And it's the display. And every time we install in a different country, I ask the exhibitors to go out on this, um, you know, uh, hunt for uh, local bottle caps. And they collect samples and they sort it out and they decide which brands are the most popular and which brands are like mostly, you know, uh, most abundant in the streets. And then we'll paint the feathers like that. So that's Pantone birds. And again, as an ecosystem designer, I had to think about how to break down plastics, how to metabolize plastics, and, uh, you know, how to make all these organisms thrive in a fully plastic environment. And uh, for that, I needed two things. One is a sense organ, back to the Umwelt and Jacob von Uxkull, and action organs, right? So this is a plastoceptor. It's basically an eye for plastics. Um, it's hard to detect plastics just by seeing it or hearing it or tasting it, right? But um, if you had an organ that can detect plastics at a molecular level, because it's a polymer chain, then 
you would be able to just go for plastics and nothing else. So I thought about uh, these uh, series of plastoceptors. I probably had like 18, 20 different plastoceptors at this point. They follow the, um, the laws of quantum biophysics. And uh, these are like anatomical drawings of how they work. Um, my personal touch is number four, the plastic nerve, just like the optic nerve, you know, it goes to the brain. Um, another important organ is stomaximus. Uh, this is a maximized stomach. And uh, my inspiration was the bacteria that was discovered by Linda Emerald Zettler and uh, other scientists who published uh, about the plastosphere. So the question was, well, what if we had a digestive organ that had uh, this specific bacteria uh, who could, you know, filter out the ocean water and take the plastics out? So each vesicle is specialized to break down a different type of plastics. And uh, on a commercial level, we see only six different types of plastics. But in fact, there are about 20 different types of plastics out there as waste. So uh, this guy can digest uh, HDP, LDPE, acrylic, nylon, um, polypropylene, um, vinyl, uh, acrylic butylene, many different kinds. Um, this is an early prototype. And anatomical drawings. Again, I was always thinking, oh, how is it going to work? Where should I put the bacteria? How do they make the bacteria happy? How do I make it happy? Um, this is petronephros. It basically takes out uh, bisphenol A and phytolates from plastics because even if you're a plastic-loving creature, you're a plastivore, you need to get rid of certain toxins because these toxins are so toxic, uh, you know, they will cause cancer and tumors and all kinds of uh, nasty uh, effects in your system if you don't get rid of them. So I had to have a kidney for plastics. And uh, this is a petrogestative system for birds where the beak and uh, the uh, proventriculus, the crop, all of it is redesigned so that they can actually break down plastics, which is flexible, and that's why they can't really get rid of it. Um, so these were a set of organs, and here are some pictures of the installation. I particularly love this image. It was a moment where this father showed up with his baby, and he was like, what is this organ? And um, I also had, in other iterations, data visualizations of the top uh, uh, 10 countries who are, uh, you know, uh, releasing the most amount of plastics together with the top 10 companies who are producing the most amount of uh, plastics. Uh, this is in uh, Moscow. Yeah. How are we doing? All right. Okay. Okay. This is, um, yeah, this is the last one I'm going to talk about. Um, it's a different one. Um, it's not that new, it's 2016 actually, uh, but it's maybe the cutest one. So it's the Kitty AI. And um, this project, again, I was thinking about, uh, you know, inventing different tools to convey these narratives. And uh, Uh, democracy or lack thereof, uh, big data and affective computing were my starting points. So affective computing is basically um, a field that started around 1997 by Rosalind Picard at MIT Media Lab. And uh, before her, emotions wasn't um, a subject matter that computer scientists really thought about. And here she says, I want to be taken seriously, but emotion wasn't a serious topic. Um, but with uh, her lab, uh, she, and with one of her PhD students, uh, El Kalubi, Rana El Kalubi, she showed that uh, all these people were wrong. Uh, this is an excerpt from 
the company that we they founded as part of content uh, um, and technology that came out of their lab are made better and their work when they were informed emotion by detection human uh, software and At now there's Ativa, all kinds of we quantify other applications emotions and products the that they have again this, this is an older video we've built where, the most um, accurate they automated use, facial coding uh, system that uh, exists the, the, today the theory of emotion um, moment by moment invented or state originated by Paul Ekman who is a neuroscientist this is the only neuroscientist and Paul Ekman came up with a way to quantify facial expressions to indicate any different face, emotions any place and taking any his um, model of quantifiable time. emotions Rana over the past three uh, created the years, our software has which processed could more detect than one billion frames of face of, video uh, for people watching you know, advertisements and entertainment content in over 70 countries. Guess not this is the world's and, uh, largest repository of to emotional tell, response you know, whether to you're digital angry media. Or upset this research or happy enables optimization, so prediction, this is, uh, their ad advertisement, basically. Then my other inspiration was uh, this movie by Spike Jonze, Her, Mr. where Trombley, welcome to the a lonely first man falls in love with his system. operating system. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Okay. Are you social or antisocial? I guess I haven't been social in a while. How would you describe your relationship with your mother? <laughs> Thank you. Please wait as your operating system is initiated. Hello, I'm here. Hi. Hi. I'm Samantha. That's it. So, um, well, it's not um, like it's not breaking news that with the in the next couple of years we will have dev our devices. Uh, we'll have devices like mobile our fo mobile phones who can recognize our emotions by following our face. Uh, face detection is already a big thing if you're following the news. Um, it's becoming a problem for certain countries or corporations, right? Facial uh, tracking. Uh, but the thing is, if you can track the face, uh, you, not only you can uh, define uh, someone's identity, but you can also access their emotional uh, landscape, right? Now, there are many problems with that, of course. And uh, the algorithms that are out there, including Paul Ekman's model of how we detect emotions, might not be accurate. But regardless of all of that, there is a lot of momentum in this direction. So thinking about all of these, uh, my idea was basically uh, to have an artificial intelligence which would have the emotional capacity of a kitten. So Kitty AI for beginners. Um, Kitty AI is a governor in the year 2039. Honestly, it's not set in stone. Maybe it will change. Uh, in a European city. Uh, this is Louis XIV. Um, I am the state. And Kitty AI is a materialization of this. Oops, I don't have the image. Yeah. Um, it basically lives in its citizens' mobile phones. Uh, it's emotionally intelligent, meaning not only it recognizes your emotional status, it can also reciprocate those, and it can love up to three million people. It's an example of applied micro-democracy, meaning um, if something is wrong, uh, let's say an infrastructure problem, such as there's a hole in the ground and a car fell on this. Uh, you can report it to the Kitty AI because she's on your phone. And if enough number of people say the same thing about the hole, an action will be taken. And it'll be, the action will be taken rather uh, very sh in a very short amount of time, right? Whereas um, with our current model of democracy or politics, um, actions might be very delayed and we vote for one person and then we are subject to the decision-making uh, capacities of that person for about four years or longer. Um, it's a network intelligence, um, meaning it works with a lot of different AIs. 
I'm gonna skip this slide and I can't. Oh, I did, right. It's a respected member of the parliament. Come back image, yes. Um, right, it's um, able to communicate with humans very well, right? That's Obama and that's Putin. Now, to help you understand who Kitty AI is better, I can compare it with a regular politician. So Kitty AI is attentive, whereas a regular politician may or may not care. Kitty AI is available, uh, whereas a regular politician might have limited to zero availability. Uh, it's a two-sided communication with Kitty AI, meaning you text the Kitty AI or you know, leave a voice email or something and Kitty AI will say something back to you. Whereas the other one is one-sided, only tweeting, tweeting and no response to you. Kitty AI speaks machine languages plus languages spoken by its citizens, barely speaks English. Uh, Kitty AI looks like a kitten. Um, the list doesn't end there and Kitty AI lives on your mobile devices. Uh, Trump lives in Trump Tower, doesn't use the Hawaii house as much. Kitty AI can love, right, because it has the emotional capacity of a kitten. And a uh, regular politician has the capacity to love themselves. Kitty AI practices applied micro-democracy, whereas um, a regular politician would be abstract macro-democracy, meaning time delays, four years, not really listening to what everyone else is saying. And um, Kitty AI is a cute pussy cat, whereas Trump will grab you by the pussy. Kitty AI is a ta doer and the other one is a talker. Now, uh, these are some campaign images. And uh, to end the talk, I'll play a very little excerpt from the film uh, which launched uh, Kitty AI. Love means care, I care about you. Here I am, available to you exactly when you need me, where you need me. Here I am, an emotional being tending to your most secret emotions. Yet, I'm able to manage all this input to guarantee that your kids are picked up from the kindergarten on time, the air you breathe has less particulate matter in it, the water you drink is lead free, your apartments get enough sunshine, your waste gets recycled at 84%, your health is monitored, and your future is bright enough. I am technology. I am love. I am your absolute governor. I am the kitty AI. All right, uh, to sum up, imperceptibility is an aesthetic problem. It is at the root of many issues that we're experiencing, or at least one of the reasons why we're experiencing these problems, because I certainly believe all of us are uh, good and we want to do good. No one really wants to purposefully kill a sperm male, baby sperm male, but it happens. And um, art and design has immense power. Uh, for instance, art and design can enrich urban fa fa fabric by you know, making uh, public art that raises awareness about these issues or that offers sustainable solutions instead of just erecting another piece of metal junk. We can uh, you know, cultivate spaces or platforms where we can discuss these problems or we can use you know, uh, recycled materials or different types of ways to rebuild you know, symbols for our time. Uh, we can penetrate entertainment Entertainment has ridiculous power. I mean, who doesn't, who isn't subject to uh, the newest Game of Thrones tweet, right? I'm trying to not watch Game of Thrones because I want to watch all of it together. But since everyone is tweeting about it, now I know what happened, right? So it's this thing, entertainment is coming to me from all these different directions. But artists and designers can uh, create, using your term, a counterforce or an alternate culture where we talk about you know, these issues or where we uh, break the imperceptibility of certain problems. Uh, so this means indie games and alternative cinema. I've 
didn't add AR and VR, but those can, of course, be tools for this as well. Uh, Ecoactive start, right? And uh, it's pretty open-ended, so I'm not gonna have like number one, number two for that. Uh, design is another really big force. Uh, we don't need another, you know, alien-looking lemon squeezer. We don't need another gorgeous uh, chaise long. We don't need another uh, petroleum-based uh, fossil fuel burning sports car. But we need really good design solutions, right? Uh, for instance, with packaging, I didn't include images here, but um, we see, for instance, um, how um, oblivious and blind certain designers could be with packaging. And then we see other options where uh, there was this ingenious idea to almost make packaging disappear, right? So that could be one really obvious thing to work with. Another option could be generating radical solutions. Instead of working with the system, maybe we can design the system from ground up, like redesigning agriculture instead of designing how to package a lemon that comes here from Sri Lanka or something. Um, so these are some ways that I've been trying with my own practice, and I try to give you like a taste of that. Uh, on that sweet note, we talked about the tick, we talked about bubbles, we talked about how causality is broken, we talked about cats, and thank you very much. What are your questions, or what are some things you might want to ask, or if there's, this is kind of also turning into a platform where, like earlier today, we were talking about our emotions when we see these news, right? Um, you can bring up anything, basically. It doesn't have to be about the work. Yes? One piece that <laughs> that kind of confused me a little bit was with the feathers, because oftentimes when we look at a peacock, for example, we think, oh my gosh, those colors, it's so beautiful. How did you deal with that possible interpretation? Right, um, that's a very good question. And um, you know, I've presented that work many times at this point. It happens to be my most popular work. Uh, and I'm always asked, uh, not this particular question about feathers, but for instance, the organs as well. I'm always asked, but why are they beautiful? Why are they colorful? This is kind of an ugly subject. Like, aren't you supposed to work in that uh, frequency? Aren't you supposed to give us that message? So what I was doing was basically following a formula where I really wanted to imagine new life forms that could thrive in a world where there was only plastics and nothing else. So if a bird will emerge in that world, and if that bird happens to have feathers, and if those feathers are red and blue and green and beautiful, then I can't really help with that. I was just following the formula that nature provides us with. But I think that's a very good question to ask, because uh, as a designer and artist, you have to make those decisions as well. What are your other questions? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You you already touched on it. Um, I love your idea of. Uh, trying to make what's imperceptible perceptible. It's really important uh, if we're going to adequately address climate crisis. But I'd love to hear what you think about emotionality, you know, the role of that in communicating with people. Emotionality? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard because what I keep reading and hearing is that, and sometimes I experience it with my talks too, I'm kind of like a party pooper or I'm like a downer, 
you know, the subjects are dark and people shut down. Like these are the things I hear, right? And I did use the word poop and this is being recorded, but whatever. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, um, really good question. And for the longest time, I try to use all kinds of different things like making it absurd or making it a little funny or, you know, trying a different font or whatever, design decisions to get people more engaged in the world, work without shutting them down. But as of this year and last week, uh, the IPBES report on extinction by UN came out and if you haven't heard about it, the report is pretty good actually. They have action points as well. Uh, we will be losing one million species in the next decades. And if you read the report, it's literally the next decade, right? It's not multiple decades. And one million species, I can't even conceive it in my mind's eye. And again, a couple days later, another uh, news hit the, you know, uh, hit the TV channels. It's, uh, we've reached 415 ppm. And when I graduated, it was 380 ppm, or when I started, right? And no one thought we would reach 415 ppm uh, of CO2 levels. So now I'm thinking to myself, okay, what should I do? Do I just like still try to like adulterate my content and make it more digestible by people, try to not scare people away? Or do I just expect my audience to kind of grow up and suck it up and really embrace their grief and have some anger and work with me through the piece? So this is where I am right now. So if you ask me this question maybe like three years ago, I would say, oh, it's very important. You're the designer of their effects, effective spectrum, whatever it is. You're the engineer of their uh, you know, uh, response. So you have to be careful. But right now I'm more like, I don't know, I feel more urgency. Uh, the biological clock is ticking. So I'm just like, if you can't deal with this, Maybe you should go to that other planet, you know. Um, what are your other questions or comments? I think we're... Mm. Anyone else? I know that there, um, there was one, okay, wonderful, yes, because I was gonna close, so good. I, I guess with Kitty AI, my question is like, why, if we're imagining a future governor of sorts, like, why is its emotional spectrum limited to that of a cat? Like, what's I, can you elaborate uh, on it, that? Uh, why are we imagining? Kitty oh, AI? Uh, uh, like Kitty AI is being a limited, having a limited emotional availability. Like, why not oh, imagine the, it can fulfill all of our needs? Oh, uh, why is it not like an elephant? Sure. Or us? Yeah. Well, I think my first um, idea was to design an AI that wasn't like a mirror image of the human because artificial intelligence means it's artificial. It could be anything, but we're kind of fixated on replicating our own image, right, uh, in this system. So I thought a cat would be a good thing to do also because internet is full of cats and um, I can tap into so many cat memes, it's crazy, right? Um, so that was my starting idea, but that's a good question, also because we don't know what cats are capable of feeling. Like, I don't know what their affective spectrum is like. All I know is that my cat likes me, if I had a cat, <laughs> right? So um, I just wanted to focus on an entity, an artificial intelligence that can have that capacity to like me back or like you back, like three million people back. So I know if that answers your question, mm -hmm. but maybe it will have, you know, opponents and other AIs computing for votes, we don't know. Um, I wanted to ask you, Pinar, with regards to, um, we both have been teaching our classes and are committed to teach our classes with the environment and with issues around the environment 
like right straight front in, in our classes. Right. I know that with my students, a lot of the times we have that as they are doing, I start them with the research that it is such, such a downer, right? And students after a couple of weeks, they say it's like, you know, I am so depressed, right? right. I'm so depressed. And the moment that it goes from that depression of getting to know and understand and allowing yourself to feel, I think that perhaps I don't know Erin, if that's where you were going in terms of emotionality, because I mean, I still cry when I see those things. I still am able to allow myself to feel, but a lot of us have shut down to not feel because it is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I work towards in the class is to be able to then empower the student to be able to say, well, I have the tools of design and of art, and I'm, I'm able to mm -hmm. perhaps change the conversation and, and right. you know, kind of show something different. So I would love to hear your um, kind of perhaps a process of going from the downer in your students and then be able to then empower them because that's in a way is like know your world and then you know how to act and like you, you can take decisions. Right. Uh, I think this is really a good question. Uh, the one that I've been thinking about myself because uh, I feel like the role of the educator has been shifting a little bit and maybe this is kind of um, like a dangerous topic, I don't know, but um, I feel like the way I perceived my educators when I was younger or the way I learned from you know, my parents or people who were older than me about like the role of the educator, etc., was someone who would, um, you know, um, show me the options that are out there for me, someone who would open me up to different possibilities, someone who would put me on my life's path. Like I had a chemistry teacher in high school. He was super cool, he was from France, and I'm Turkish, French guy, awesome, he had blue eyes, and you know, that really helped me focus on chemistry. Not only he was, he wasn't that good looking, but he was just like, so open and he loved his field and I got that from him so I followed his path. So that was how I thought of education or the role of the educator. Uh, but now I'm seeing that with all the other kinds of metrics and maybe the system itself, um, I'm sometimes finding myself in the, uh, uh, in the position of an entertainer and if I'm not entertaining enough, then I'll get good reviews and I might not get tenured or I might not get students which is not great because I actually like teaching so uh, that's one thing so let's keep it there like what is my role do I am I here to entertain people or am I here to really educate them in the way I thought education worked but then another thing is of course all of these are very sad and uh, there's a lot of um, emotional burden that comes with it because it falls under the bigger category of loss. And anyone who experienced loss, you know, this could be your pet, your lover, girlfriend, boyfriend, parents, a friend, we know how it feels. It's a pretty, you know, um, um, solid and difficult thing to deal with and grief that comes with it. These are serious things to deal with. And, and now we are experiencing it at a global level. Right, um, and I personally don't, I don't have a formula for my students, but I'm just trying to show them that this is what it is, we accept this, and you are powerful enough to do something to prevent this from happening. So maybe a good r example would come from maybe the Me, Me Too movement, or women's movement, um, right? Uh, from a sp place where no one could talk about their personal pain and troubles like rape or, I know, um, you know, harassment, things that you couldn't talk about and it was really difficult to talk about, to a place where you can openly, publicly discuss these things. So maybe we will have that very soon, and I think we should. Um, but. I don't know, I don't have a formula. I'm just also experimenting because uh, like some, when I showed the baby sperm whale, for instance, 
then it's so hard for them to respond to the assignments because everyone is so sad. And I think I lost my audience after some of those images too here. So I'm sorry for that. But um, that's what's happening. Uh, the numbers are crazy. Like um, I'm actually uh, making a database of the, the cetacean loss due to uh, climate crisis and plastic pollution, and it's crazy. Thank you, Pinar. Thank you. Thank you so much.